So this is a really amazing brief because I do a lot of talking about my business, but to be asked to do a talk about something that you've never talked about before, it, I mean, I've spent months on this. Christ, it's really difficult. <laughs> but um, there is an idea that I've been thinking about and obsessing about for seven years, and I've never really talked about it. And in the process of thinking about this, I sort of realised that that is actually the route to my business. So I am going to talk briefly about the business and kind of how it came about. But it starts off with something a bit different. Um, and my central thing that really guides me is that you think you have ideas. And what I, what I think is that you don't have ideas. Ideas have you. And this is the greatest idea that's ever had me. And I hope by the end, it'll have all of you too. Um, oh, OK, Christ. So this is it. Um, Spielzeug. Now, this is a, a German word, and it means toy. The direct translation is play piece. And it's a bit like schadenfreude and zeitgeist in that we don't have an equivalent word for it. So I'm proposing that we start to use this in the same way. Now, having said that, every German person I've met um, says that this doesn't have the meaning that I think it does. So <laughs> just putting that out there. Um, but the idea is, is that it has this... Um, it's, a feeling that children, you know children, they run around and they have stones in their hands and they, you don't know why they're carrying them, but they can't let go of them. And my son had Thomas Tank Engine trains, he held it all the time. And it's a similar thing, it's like something that you just want to hold, something that you want to kind of engage with. Um, and I, just to pause on the kind of language thing, um, oh, I haven't set my timer. Um, I'm really fascinated by, I'm a verbal thinker, okay, so everything, um, the way I understand the world, my conscious experience of the world is governed entirely by the language I think in. And so it's really interesting that the world contains, you know, human experience contains all kinds of ways of thinking, but unless you have a word to capture it, then you can't think it. And this is something that you sh should think about whenever you read that a language has died, and you might think, oh, sh it doesn't matter if the language has died because no one's speaking it. But the point is that language may contain concepts that we don't have, and they could completely transform the way we live. Um, so I think that's a really interesting thing, and it's kind of connected to, to Unbound. And it's all, about that, so it's all about that kind of communication and meaning. So going back to Spielzeug, um, my profession, before doing what I do now, um, I was a writer. Well, I still am a writer. Maybe one day I'll get back to it. Um, and I, this is going to sound a bit grand, but... Um, Basically, I'm really scared of dying, and I have this, there's this brilliant quote from Woody Allen, which he says, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work, I want to achieve it by not dying. <laughs> um, and so for me, my life really is, um, there's another, another brilliant quote from Seneca, who said, um, it's, a really, it's, a, it's kind of a really interesting idea that it takes a whole lifetime to learn how to live, and what may surprise you more, it takes a whole lifetime to learn how to die. And so what drives me is I want to come to terms with being alive before I die. And so I'm spending my life essentially trying to do things that help me to learn about myself and what it means to be alive. And when you, and I, all the books I've done, I've done 10 books, and they've all, that's been the central premise about all of them. Now, if you look at my books on Amazon, you're going to think I'm talking total shit because the books are, I did a book called Crap Towns about the worst place to live in Britain, uh, which I got sued for in Death Threats. And I've done, I did a book about the worst, my worst jobs I'd ever had, um, which, is, which is interesting. And I've, you know, I've done all kinds of crazy things. I drove across England in a 1957 electric milk float for a book called Three Men in a Float to try and understand whether you can love travel and the planet at the same time. And through that, I realized that when you slow down, you basically expand your consciousness. Um, so, and I've also, I also tried to get arrested while wearing a teddy bear suit for a book I did about I, called I Fought the Door. Um, that was a really interesting one, actually. The, the, set, the point of that book, I discovered there are loads of old laws. Like, you can't get in uh, within 100 metres of the Queen if you're not wearing socks. And it's illegal to take possession of a beach whale. And you can't carry a bag of soot along a path in a place called Congleton. I had this idea that I would go and break all these laws. Now, it would be really funny. Um, and at the time, I read about a guy who'd just been arrested in Parliament Square for eating a cake that had the words freedom of speech written on it in icing. 
and it was because the government, um, the Tony Blair's government, brought in legislation that basically criminalised protests within a thousand metres of Parliament. So loads of people started to do demonstrations and not ask for permission and get arrested in order to prove the lunacy of them. So I organised a cricket match for the ashes of Magna Carta in Parliament Square on the day of the London Marathon, which was interesting. Um, but anyway, so <laughs> all my books have been an attempt to try and understand the world. And it came to, after the milk float, I'm, I'm not really interested in machinery, I have no interest in machines, but I got quite attached to our milk float, which we christened the mighty one after Che Guevara's motorbike. <laughs> and I started to get interested in machines, and my publisher, John Murray at the time, said, you know, why don't you go out and find out about why men love machines? So I spent, basically spent a year um, examining all the machines of the industrial age, and I examined them in the order in which they were invented. So I started with a canal boat and ended with an aeroplane. And I, my, the kind of thing was I had to drive them or pilot them as well as learn about their history. And I met enthusiasts that loved them all to kind of try and understand why men love machines. Uh, which brings me to spiritual. So uh, towards the end of my journey, I went to meet a man who was a tank enthusiast. Um, and we had the most amazing time in the countryside driving a Russian tank around, uh, which was hilarious. And I got completely, it was a brilliant day. And I anyone that's wondering whether spending the day driving a tank around a field is fun, it's awesome. <laughs> um, and, but towards the end, of the end of my time with Andy, I kind of sat down and said, so come on, Andy, what is it? You know, why do men love machines? What do you, what's the thing? And I'd had lots of answers, but he gave me the most interesting one. And he said, have you ever heard of Spielzeug? I was like, no, I've never heard of Spielzeug. He said, well, Spielzeug's why men love machines. I said, well, okay, well, what does it mean? He said, well, if you look at the blueprints for a machine or the plans to have for a machine, you won't see Spielzeug there. And if you look at the materials that the machine's made from, um, you won't find Spielzeug there. But there's something that happens between the kind of designing of it and the making of it, that, that when it's finished, it's got this extra thing. And you can't measure it. You can't kind of explain it. You can't point to it. But that thing is called Spielzeug. And that, that's why men love machines. So I was sort of thinking, OK, well, that's quite cool. That's a kind of interesting idea that there's this thing that you can't measure and capture. And maybe it's to do with craft. And you know, that's kind of, I like that. And, but he could tell I wasn't quite getting it. So he said, um, well, follow me, and I'll show you what I mean. I'm like, OK. So I follow him out of his house, and we go through the farm. And we come up to a door, which has got like 12 padlocks on it. And I start to get a little bit nervous. <laughs> um, and next to the door is a safe. And Andy spends some time on the safe, and he opens the safe. And then he takes a key out of his pocket and opens a locked box in the safe. And then he gets all the keys, and he starts to unlock the padlocks. And I am shitty at this point. <laughs> what the hell is going to be in this room, right? Um, so I walk in the room, and uh, he turns the lights on, and I'm in an armory. And every wall is covered in handguns. And right in front of me is an anti-tank anti gun. Like, it's an enormous thing, and I am like, whoa. Uh, OK. Now, and I know guns. I'm going to talk a little bit about guns. I don't like guns. It's not about guns. And I understand the connotations that guns have, but just bear with me. So Andy said to me, I'm going to show you Spielzeug. And the way I'm going to do it is you're going to close your eyes, and I'm going to give you a gun. And then you're going to hold it for 10 seconds with your eyes closed. Then I'm going to take that gun away, and then I'm going to give you another gun. And you're going to hold that gun for 10 seconds. Then I'm going to take that gun, and you're going to open your eyes, and you're going to tell me which gun is the best made. And I'm like... Uh, OK, all right. I mean, now I'm thinking, this guy is mental. Because <laughs> what? I don't know anything about it. I can't tell a gun. I mean, it's just nuts. Anyway, so I close my eyes, and he gives me a gun. And it's kind of, yeah, I don't know. I've kind of, never held a gun before. It's kind of, ooh, hmm. And then it's, suddenly it's taken away, and he puts another gun in my hand. And this gun, I don't, it, it's a hard to put. It's, it sort of tastes a bit like a, a shandy with too much lemonade. You know, it's just a bit kind of. Yeah, it's not quite there. And, and, and then that gun disappears and I open my eyes and he says, right, which is the best gun? And I'm like, well, I, I don't know. He said, well, what do you think is the best gun? I said, well, I don't know, the first one? He said, correct. It's uh, the Walther PPK, used in every James Bond movie from Doctor No Till Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, the other one is a rep replica of a Japanese gun. Um, and the reason you can tell the Walther PPK is the best made gun is because it has Spielzeug and you could feel it. And I'm like, OK. <laughs> Again, interesting. He said, and basically, I just didn't believe him, so he did it again, and I got it right. And we did it again, and I got it right. And when I got it right nine times, I started to think, OK, this is really, really interesting. Um, so I'm driving home, and I'm thinking about this feeling and this idea that you can connect to something, and you can't explain why you're connecting to it, but you can just feel that you're, you can connect to it. Um, 
And I've talked to my friend John about it on the phone, and he said, oh, that's really, really interesting. And he told me another story. And this story was one that he'd been told by an estate agent. And the estate agent was helping a blind man find a new place to live. And he had a list of criteria, and he was taking this blind man to these flats and houses. Um, and he was driving him crazy, because they would open the front door, he would walk in the front door and stand there, spend about 10 seconds there, and then just go, no, and leave. And the estate agent got to like the 17th person. He's like, this guy, he's blind. He's taking the fucking piss out of him. This is ridiculous. And on the 18th one, the blind man, he walked into the room, sat there, and said, yeah, this is it. I'm buying this one. And the estate was like, what? How can you possibly? And then he said, and then he realized that the blind man was using the same thing that every one of us uses when we look for a place to live. We have a list of criteria of all the things we want to, it to contain. But what actually what we're looking for, we're looking for that thing that when we walk in the front door, we're going, this is where I'm supposed to live. And that is one of the most expensive things you will ever buy, right? Your house or if you're renting. And isn't it interesting that we're all looking for that undefinable, immeasurable, magical thing that we can't quite express? We can't tell you, we can't point to it, we can't say it's in the walls, we can't say where it is, but we can feel it. And that kind of started to get me really excited, because if you start to think, well, if, you, if you're kind of interacting with the world in that way, that's quite interesting. And, but we don't have a word to express it, so I start to think, well, this is called Spielzeug. And I start to think, well, there's loads of examples in my life where I'm looking for Spielzeug, where I found it in things. You know, 99.9% .9 of shoes don't contain Spielzeug, but some do. And then I read that um, Plato had a theory of forms, if you heard about this, where the idea that there's this perfect place and everything there are perfect versions of everything in this place. So there's a chair in this place, in this perfect place. And every chair in our world, in our, you know, where we live, is an attempt to recreate that one perfect chair. Now, I don't believe that that's true, but it, that makes me think Plato was thinking about Spielzeug. He's thinking that there are things in the world that are right for reasons we can't explain. And I rang my friend who was a, works in, he's a semiotician, he does brand analysis. And I said, well, what do you think of this idea? He said, oh, that's really interesting, because my job is to put that in brands and things that don't have it. <laughs> what I'm supposed to do is I'm trying to create that connection, that meaning, in objects, so that when people go and buy them, they feel like they have them. I said, well, that's interesting, because we, you know, we're, we're consumerists, right? And we're always, trying to, we're always buying things, and sometimes we feel empty after we've got them. So that starts to make me really intrigued. And I'm a huge fan of an author called Antoine Saint-Exupéry, who wrote a book called Little Prince. And there's an amazing thing in that book. It tells a story of him crash landing in the desert, and he, this prince falls from, the, falls from the stars. And they have these amazing conversations. And the kind of central point of that book is that his conclusion is that everything that's meaningful is invisible to the eye. And then you, I started to think, well, Spielzeug isn't just in, you know, it's not, it's not just in physical things. It's in experience. It's in relationships. And then you start to think, well, everything important about being a human being are things you can't plot on a graph, like love, kindness, curiosity, integrity. All these things are things which are completely central to who we are as human beings, and yet it's impossible to measure them. And because it's impossible to measure them, all the kind of power structures that govern our lives have no time for this stuff, even though this is the stuff, like this is the most important thing. And there's a really good way of explaining that, because if this sounds, I'm aware this might sound a bit too abstract, I did warn you this is a kind of idea in uh, fruition, but, but I don't know if you ever think about time. You can think about time in this way. So we all think about time as being this measurable, fixed thing. It's, a t uh, it's an arrow that goes from the past through the present and off into the future. And the Greeks had a god of time called Kronos, and chronological watches we are named in honor of Kronos. But they also had another kind of time. And what I love about this god of time is called Kairos. I don't know if you've heard of Kairos. Kairos is fucking amazing. Um, but it's immeasurable time. It's divine time. Kairos is the god of the divine moment, and he looks really interesting because he has a long forelock of hair, and the back of his head is shaved completely bald. And the reason he looks the way he does is when you see Kairos approaching, you have to grab hold of him. You have to seize him. And this is where seize the day comes from. You have to seize him and seize the opportunity that he brings. And the reason he's got the ball at the back is because once he's gone past you, there's nothing to grab hold of. And he's gone forever, and all you can see is him. So again, we, this is a kind of time that we can't measure, yet we all as people know this is the most intrinsic and important kind of time in the world. This is kissing the woman of your dreams, or taking the opportunity, or doing the thing that you really care about. Um, 
So I'm completely buzzing now. I've got, this is the idea of my life. This is, this is the best idea that's ever had me. And I'm a writer. This is brilliant, right? I'm going to write a book. Uh, I'm going to communicate it through the form of writing a book. So I ring my publisher and they're like, this is amazing. Wow, this is an amazing idea. This is exactly what we want to do. Um, but unfortunately, this all happened about six months after the economic crash. And essentially, uh, to cut a long story short, my publisher said to me, we're really sorry, but we're not going to pay you to write this book. And I tried other publishers, and they said the same things. You know, we're beco they're becoming more risk averse. They're looking for brand authors that are brands. They're not looking for kinds of authors like me, a kind of middleist type author who's, you know, ha had a reasonable career. And one of the things I didn't mention earlier is that I'm a double university dropout. I went twice and dropped out twice, which I, I'm sure might, you can imagine how much my parents love that. Um, but one of the things that that means is that I have no safety net. So I basically spent 10 years building a career as an author, and I'd fulfilled all my ambitions. I'd had a bestseller. I'd even done a program on Radio 4, which is like, oh my god, the kind of major aspiration of the middle classes. Um, <laughs> so I managed to achieve all these things. And, and basically, because I have no qualifications to, it, to be a writer, and it turns out to be an entrepreneur, excellent. Um, they're the only things I have the qualifications to do. Um, so I found myself back earning minimum wage, doing really shit jobs. And this was, this was a really dark time. And there, there have been three times in my life when I've had to completely redefine myself and basically start from scratch. And it's, you know, it's tough, really hard. And this time was the hardest of all because the thing that gets you through is that you aspire to achieve certain things. And then when you achieve them and you still end up with nothing. You know, I had 10 years. Where was my house? Where was my car? Why, why do I literally have no money? And that was a really dark, dark time. And uh, I think, in retrospect, that's when my marriage started to disintegrate. The, the pressure of not being able to earn money, the kind of humiliation of that, and feeling like you have no power. Um, but at that point, I did have lights in my life. I had my exquisite and extraordinary children, and I had Spielzeug. So I, was, I remember I was cleaning out the rat-infested basement of a, an accountant in Bognor Regis, which is a town 10 years earlier I had slagged off for of being crap. Oh, the irony. Um, and I'm sat on the, be on the beach. And interesting, this is it. Uh, yeah, interesting. This is the same beach where William Blake had visions, which is true. Um, I'm on my lunch hour, and I'm thinking, fuck, what's happened? And I realised I'd spent 10 years building an audience for my books, but I'd never captured the name of a single person, a single person that had ever bought my books. And because I have no safety net and I have no qualifications, I just think, well, I don't, you know, I'll just do it myself. So I had this brilliant idea. I'm going to talk about Spieltoig. I'm going to talk about it on a website. I'm going to make a video. I'm going to talk about it. And then I'm going to get people to pledge money. And if I get enough money, I'm going to write the book. And I was sat down with my friends, John and Justin. And Justin immediately said to me, well, that's amazing. Why doesn't everyone do that? Because every author, it turns out, not every author, but most authors are feeling the same thing as I am. People with far better sales figures than me can't publish the books they want to write because the publishers don't connect with the people that actually buy their products. They sell books to retailers. They don't sell books to readers. And because there was all this stuff in between authors and readers, the spread of ideas, the communication, the language, the stuff I started off talking about, that wasn't getting through. There wasn't a platform that allowed those two things to come together. And, but I was just thinking about Spieltoig. But Justin was like, well, why don't everyone should do that? I was like, really? And then John, uh, my other friend, um, was like, yeah, there's this thing called Kickstarter, which was only a year old at the time. We could do crowdfunding. And then he said, oh my god, I've just remembered. S uh, Samuel Johnson funded his dictionary through crowdfunding. Uh, Dickens funded his books, some of his books through crowdfunding. They would get patrons to pledge money in advance of the author writing the book. And then the author would thank that person in the back of the book. And so when they would get a copy of the book with their name in the bag, and he was like, oh my god, we can do that. So another agonizing irony is that I never wrote my book um, because I accidentally ended up running a fucking business. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it's really, and it's so interesting. But this is kind of one of the things that I've realized is that because the idea has you and you don't have the idea, you've got to let it take you where it goes. You don't think you can control it. You've just got to follow it. And you've got to follow it through your instincts. You've got to follow it through the path it wants to take. And it's really crucial that you don't think you own it. You know, it's really important that you understand that these things are just floating out there. 
And my, my view is that if you, if you kind of align yourself with what you care about and what you mean, if you mean it, if you mean what you're doing, this stuff just falls on you. It's like you wouldn't run around trying to catch a butterfly, but if you sit down in the right spot, one will land on you. And it's that kind of sort of attitude. Um, so yeah, so Unbound, and we launched, as Andy said, we launched four years and two, two weeks ago, at Hay on Y. Um, and it's, you know, it's been agony. I would take a bullet for the, my two friends, John and Justin, who we started together. The things we have been through, it's, it's, I mean, it's really good that I would take a bullet for them because we all want to shoot each other quite often. <laughs> um, but our friendship has been completely, completely crucial to the, to the trajectory of the business because our friendship is more important than our business. And that's been a really important part of it, that the three of us have fought every step of the way together to make it happen. You know, I get to be CEO and I get to do talks like this, but the th it's the three of us. It's the combination of the three of us. And that's another really important thing that you try and say, it's my idea. It was, it was kind of, I don't really know whose idea it was. It just kind of, but it, it was a combination of the three of us getting together, thinking about this, that just ended up being this. And now we have like 20 people that work for us who are helping define what it becomes. Um, so yeah, so this year we won website of the year, publisher's website of the year, and we won book of the year. And they're the only two things we do, so we're fucking smashing it. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure I'm out of time. But I just want to have one, mention one book, which is called The Wake. And it's a perfect reason of, for why we're doing it, and it's the perfect reason why Unbound is so important. Um, the Wake is a completely impossible book to sell. It's written in its own language, and it tells the story of the, in, the resistance to the invasion of 1066. It's written by an extraordinary writer called Paul Kingsnorth. And The, the Wake... Um, was turned down by every publisher in London. And it was turned down for perfectly sound commercial <coughs> reasons because it's impossible to sell a book. Like Sainsbury's won Bookshop of the Year two years ago. So if you're the kind of author that sells in Sainsbury's, publishing is probably working okay. But a book written in its own language that tells that story, is that was not that kind of book. But we found 400 people that wanted to pledge to make that book happen. And then that book did happen. And then it started to win prizes, and it was long-listed for the Man Booker Prize. It's won prizes, it's been nominated for loads of other prizes. Mark Rylance has just bought the film rights. So, and in the, in the back of The Wake are the names of 400 people. And without those people, The Wake wouldn't exist. And what's interesting about that is that they weren't buying a book. They are curating their own experience. They're not passively consuming. They're deciding for themselves what books they want to read. And the energy you get when you take the gatekeepers out and you allow that connection to happen... Um, is really extraordinary. So, there you go. Spielzeug. Um, it's the great idea that's ever had me, and I very much hope it's an idea that has all of you too. Thank you very much.